Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the study this morning. Uh, before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have each morning uh, to come and study together, to open your word. And we're thankful for the people that participate live, but also those that um, watch on the internet later. We pray that you can bless each person in their personal study. And um, we ask, Lord, that as we um, look at these things this morning, that your Holy Spirit uh, can impress our hearts and minds with the truths that are in your word. Uh, we can have a conviction and a power uh, to live a Christian life. Uh, be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so I was saying just before we started recording that uh, uh, yesterday we did a summary of, of sort of how we're looking at these lines. And, and so we addressed uh, quite a number of points and details. Um, and some of these had come from uh, the Sabbath, uh, or not Sabbath, Sunday afternoon study, <clears throat> where um, I was in a lot of pain. So <clears throat> I was, and I had a bad headache. And so I wasn't concentrating very well. <clears throat> but in that study, we had, had looked at how uh, the way mark of March 27th um, has all of these ties to, um, to our lines. And, and particularly when we look at that way mark that we're going to, you know, we're calling the midnight cry way mark. Um, March 27th, 2021 is uh, the Passover on the rabbinic calendar. It's the eighth month, 13th day on the Islamic calendar. It's the seventh day, seventh month on the French uh, Republican calendar. Um, and it's also, if we take the Julian date of March 27th, it's the seven, 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 the last three digits on the Mayan calendar. Um, and we're saying that it's the midnight cry and that numbers three and Acts 27 are um, really representing the first and second angel's message in a line where we zoom into March 27th, 2021. And the reason why that was important had to do with, with um, this line of Deborah and Barak that we're going to try to finish off today. Now, so we will come back to those points about March 27th. As well, then, when we're looking at the story of Judges chapter 4, we were addressing the, the symbolism of JL. Now, when I look at this, I see for me, a personal line um, that is meant much of what, what's, what happened when I was in the School of the Prophets. And um, those, the way that that uh, situation unfolded, uh, to me, uh, parallels what we see here in this story regarding uh, Heber and J.L., um, which is Heber's wife, with this uh, spike that she puts through Sisera's head, uh, we could see at least that um, there is a parallel there with what happened with Parminder. We could take this to symbolically represent what happened with this message of Parminder. Obviously, these aren't people in our time. These are messages. Um, now, so JL is kind of an, an odd character here in this story that um, there is this invitation to um, uh, a Barak that he then um, contemplates and he, he accepts it, but on the conditions that uh, Deborah is going to go with him. Um, but that this will be to the honor of a woman, not to his honor. And exactly what that means, I and mean, we've explored it a bit. But now we have this, and, and if we look at that as being a message, right? So not a person, uh, but a message. Even if people are attached to that message, it's, it's a message. Now, um, 
the message that there is no honor to, um, what would that message be that doesn't receive honor? And why is this honor then transferred to this other message that's represented by J.L., Heber's wife? Would this be the message of July 18th? Okay, yeah, so so we're saying that the message of Barak is the message of July 18th, right? That's right. The, I understand it. Now, it does relate to all of the chronology, uh, but it's this chronology of July 18th, specifically. That's, that's the thing that doesn't receive honor. But some other message is going to be receiving honor, and this is this message that's represented by this spike uh, in the hand of JL, right? And, and so that message, I mean, what could it be that, that ends up receiving honor? So, so we can see all through this history in from September 23rd, 2017 to November 9th, uh, 2019, that the message of July 18th does not receive honor in that line. But it's going to come to this point where we get to November 9th, and then we are going to get the message of July 18th by then. But the question is, does it still, does it still not yet have honor? Is there something else, some other message that's represented by this nail of the tent that, JL puts in through the temples of Sisera. Is there something else that, that, that ends up not replacing July 18th, but that comes out of this July 18th message that actually does receive honor? But, you know, here it's going to be November 9th. So, so if we think about November 9th as what actually happened on November 9th, so we discussed it a little bit. So I'm, I'm at Ark, the School of the Prophets, right, in Arkansas on November 9th. Stephen's there. Adilio is there. They, they came quite a bit before I did, and they left quite a bit after I did. I was just there briefly for really about three days. Um, you know, I was there. I got there Thursday, and I was there. Um, did I get there Thursday? Yeah, I was there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I left Monday. And um, yeah, so, but I was there on November 9th. and what I ended up presenting was uh, not really July eighteenth. I was presenting the two seventy three. Now, so I'm, I'm going to look at that, what I presented on, on November 9th. So I'm going to get my diagrams up here. Switch screens. So. <clears throat> Might have to draw some of this out. Now, this is um, so I'm just flipping through trying to find this. I got a lot of two seven threes in the in here. So uh, the one that I want. Is, is this one here. Okay, so this may not be, there's, there's lots happening in these drawings. So, um,
Is it this one or is it this one? Uh, this one here. <clears throat> so there's going to be more, and I'm going to have to draw this out. Now, what I have here is a date, October 11th, 2019. And you see these 273 days. These goes to July 10th, 2020. And then you have 273 days that go to this March 27th, 2021 date on the Julian calendar. So we know that there's 252 days from July 18th to March 27th, 2021. And from July 10th to July 18th is um, eight days. And then you got uh, over here on this side, you're going to have uh, 13 days. And 8 plus 13 is 21. And so if you add 21 to 252, you get 273. Now, does anybody know why these two periods of 273 days are here? What that resulted from why because I don't have the reason why they're there anybody remember that because I think this is pretty obscure you know Stephen might remember um, Now, this is something I figured out. What's that? The October 11th, 273 from there. Yeah. To July, to July 10th. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have these 270. So July 10 happens to be a date that's the center of these other two dates, October 11th and April 19th. Um, April, October 11th, two. 2019 and April 9th uh, on the Julian calendar. Uh, it's March 27th. Um, and that's that date is uh, in 2021. So, so July 10th is just the center of that. Now, July 10th as a symbol is... 10th day of the seventh month. Yeah, so the 10th day of the seventh month. Which, which is also a symbol of July 18th, because the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the year um, on the biblical calendar, right? So, so we got that symbol there for um, July, July 18th in that July 10th date. And you also have the eight days, which is a symbol as well from July 10th to July 18th. But how did I come with, up with October 11th, 2019 and April 9th? Uh, 2021. Do you remember? So I don't think anybody remember. If Stephen doesn't. It's about vague. Okay, right. So this is going to be the result of this. So what happened is I made a prediction about October 10th, and I'm not going to go into that study, but uh, based upon um, uh, the dark day um, in using a, a structure that came from that, I came up with the date, October 10th, um, 2019. I didn't have any event for it, um, but on October 10th, I was uh, doing a study regarding um, uh, the mind calendar. And I came to, because I'd, I'd come to understand that there was this failed prediction. And I'd written to Jeff on April 26th, um, 2019, that uh, July 18th was in a line of failed predictions. Um, and, and that included an understanding of the Mayan calendar, right? So I know this is a rather involved study, and I don't want to go through all the details of it. But the very simple thing that I did is I took what we understood about Revelation 9. So remember, with Revelation 9, that's how 
one of the arguments that we had for July 18th, uh, at least for the July 18th Gregorian, it was the basis for that date. Ezekiel was the basis for the July 18th Julian date. And uh, what you see here is from July 27th, 1449, on the biblical calendar, it's the 26th day of the fourth month, and it's 391 years uh, to July 27th, 1840, from which um, Josiah Lich is going to count the 15 days to get to August 11th, right? So we should all know about that. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I came to understand is that 391 years is... Um, 12 periods of 11,900 days. Well, real technically, 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes. That gives me the period of uh, 391 solar years, or more particularly, if we use uh, Islamic years, which are based upon a lunar calendar, 403 Islamic years. So the number of days is still the same, uh, but with the Islamic calendar, we can clearly see uh, the span of time based in months. So if we, we look at how long a month is, and then we put 12 of those months in a year, and then you get 403 Islamic years, that will be a period of time that is exactly... Um, within uh, seconds, um, 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes. So that's a very, very precise measurement. Um, so that in, in alone, uh, it alone is a study in and of itself. Now, the other thing is looking at the mind calendar, we have a thing called a Bactun. Now, Bactun is a period of 144,000 days. 144,000 days is 394.2583 years. And that is, it happens to be uh, a period of time that is longer than this period of 391 years. And it's a period of time that is 1190 days longer. So again, we have this symbol of 11,900, right? Um, now, 11900 or 1190 or 11.9, we know that's all about September 11th or November 9th um, as a symbol. And that is the period of time, 11,900 days, is the period of time where we go through on the Gregorian calendar 32 years and seven months. But the Islamic calendar goes through 33 years and seven months. That means the cycle from Ramadan coming around again to the same date on the Gregorian calendar happens every 11,900 days, right? So, so this idea of the Islamic calendar, that it has this symbol of 11,9 in it, and, and that we can take this symbol of 11,9 and 12 times, 12 periods of 11,9, um, which are three, each of those are 391 months. So obviously 391 months times 12 is 391 Gregorian years. And the Islamic calendar also has um, the same number of days in, uh, in what they have as 30, uh, 33 years and seven months, which is 403 months. Right. So if you take 403 months by 12, you get 403 Islamic years. So so we have this symbol here. Now, what I did on October 10th, the day before October 11th, is I did a calculation. And the simple calculation is maybe not that simple. But what I was doing was taking this idea of a point five as or the symbol of the five, the one fifth. And I have the calculation uh, up here on the chart, but I'm, I'm going to show it here. Um, just think it's down here. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to read this. This might help people. 
it says uh, 11,900 days plus. So this is just going back over what I said, plus 11, 1190 minutes times 11.9 plus 1190 days equals 142,000, not 809 days, 20 hours, one minute, or 403 Islamic years of 354.3668 days, which is approximately 391 solar years, which is uh, 391 solar years is 142,809 days, 16 hours and 42 minutes and six seconds. So if we go between the Islamic span that we have there of that period of time of 391 years, um, we can see that it differs slightly, right? And then that's about four hours in 391 years. And 391 years of 4,836 4, synodic months. So that's the number of lunar months in 391 years with a month of 29.530587 days is 142,809 days, 22 hours and three minutes. So you can see I've three different ways in which I'm counting that period of time. One's solar years, one is using this symbol of 11.9. So I'm taking this and multiplying it by 11.9 and adding 1190 days. Uh, so 11.9. So this is different than just multiplying it by 12. So I know I probably threw everybody off with this. Um, and this produces a solar lunar year conjunction every 32 years and seven months Gregorian, every 33 years and seven months lunar, a period of 11,900 days, 19 hours and 50 minutes, or 11,900 days. Uh, 100 and uh, 1,190 minutes and 10 seconds. So it, it's off by 10 seconds, which is a pretty good uh, accuracy within that period of time, which is dealing with uh, um, that's a period of 32 years and seven months that it's 10 seconds off. Okay, this can be compared to 12,000 days times 12, which is 144,000 days, or 142,810 days plus 1,190 days. So if I deal with this back tune of 144,000 days, um, and I count that from the Islamic calendar, it will bring me to this uh, Mayan date. So if you look here, the Mayan date is 111871. That's the date in which um, the 391 years and 15 days begins. But if I take 144,000 uh, days, that's just going to move it to 12, 11, 8, 7, 1. That's one back two from the 11th to the 12th. So it's 144,000 days. And that brings me to October 30th, 1843. Now, October 30th, 1843. Is, you know, I, I don't know of any particular significance of that date, other than that it contains the same Mayan date, 144,000 days later. But the significance there is that is 11, 1190 days past Josiah Lich's prediction, right? So it has that characteristic. And then what I did... So I know this is, this one's a little weird, but I took this period of 142,810 days and I divided it by 12. So that's going to give me 11,900 days. And then I took, um, I multiplied it by five and then I added uh, one tenth of that. And, and so you can see what I'm saying is that here I have 11,900 days and this period of time is 1,190 days. So it's one tenth. So I'm going to take this period and, and multiply it by five. So that's going to be a 0.5, so to speak. And I'm going to do the same thing with this, 
this other period of 1190 days and then add them together. So when I do that, I, I get a span of time that brings me to October 11th, 2019. And that's 65,454 days. So it may seem rather obscure. Let me just zoom in here. There's the calculation. But it, it brought me to this date here. So it brought me from July 27th, 1840 to October 11th. And then I did the same calculation, but instead of using uh, the 142,810 days, I used the 144,000 days. So I'm going to do the same thing. Take one twelfth of that and multiply it by five. And then I'm going to take one twelfth and one tenth of that and multiply it by five and add the two together. And I get 66,000 days. So the difference between 66,000 days and 65,454 days is how many days, if you're still awake? So it'd be just a difference of 546 days. And 546 divided by 2 is 273, right? So when I look at this chart here, this diagram, you can see that if I did this calculation, it brings me to the April 9th, 2021, which is March 27th, 2021. So the 273 shows up in marking March 27th, 2021. It gives me this October 11th date, which uh, doesn't mean anything in particular other than that I had predicted an October 10th, 2019 date. And upon that date, I figured this calculation, which led me to the next day. <coughs> and um, the difference, of course, here, here you can see there's the eight days between July 10th and July 18th. And this is the Julian date of March 27th, which is the Gregorian date of April 19th. And so this is what I presented on November 9th. So I presented this symbol of this 273. We're now, now tied to uh, this structure, the structure that comes from the Mayan calendar and Revelation chapter 9. So now that we've done that, what does this mean? What could this possibly mean in connection with understanding this line down here of Deborah and Barak? Because I'm saying this was presented on November 9th. And what was presented on November 9th, I believe, is this spike that JL delivers. Who's the wife of Heber? Who's a Kenite? So what is the what are the symbols here that are being addressed? with this study on the mind calendar and the 273 days. And how is this a spike in the temples of the message of, of Cicero, Parminder? And this is the message that then has honor. Ultimately, it's going to be the message that receives honor. With the inclusion of the 273, is this not those that would actually give part of the, the final warning message? Okay. Um, well, so definitely it has to do about the message to the Levites. Right. And and we know that the message to the Levites is not July 18, 2020. But it's something that wakens the Levites. It allows them 
to understand that they need to pay attention. Right. So there is, because what's happened since, I mean, since July 18th has been an unfolding of light that even this movement has not appreciated. That, that is, we haven't appreciated what, what it is we're being given. Um, and always when there is a message, it's first given to, to God's people, but it's not understood. Right? Right. We see that in the messages given to Daniel. Does he understand those messages when they're given to him? You know, we, we would say no, because he, he doesn't have understanding of that, the vision. And we see that this is a common, common thread, that a message is given. Jeff was given a message. Miller was given the commencement of the chain of truth. But it takes time for that message to unfold and to understand its significance. So, so we've been studying, um, especially since July 18th, but even before we have this message that's been developed or been developing in the area of chronology that isn't about predicting events in the future, even though it was used for that, that wasn't really the purpose of this message. It is to develop those who are going to give a message to the Levites. And it's also a development of that message itself. And this is the thing that troubles me the most. I mean, you know, from a personal point of view, when I look at all of this information that we've been given, and I look at it from uh, the position of somebody who's a teacher, I say, how can I possibly teach this to the Levites when even in our movement, we don't understand our own message? We don't understand what we've been given. You know, and here's an example where uh, something that was presented on November 9th, and, and many may have seen that video, uh, it was just two short studies. You know, one was the Sabbath school superintendent sort of thing, Sabbath school thing. And the other was just a, a short afternoon study. And, and I'm showing how July 18th is in a line of failed predictions and that it's tied to this message to the Levites symbol. And nobody seemed to really get it. It, it definitely didn't stick in our minds. And we, and when, you know, we have, um, when I say I set, sent it to Jeff on what was I saying here? So November 9th, 2019. I said I sent it to Jeff April 26, 2019, but it's going to be April 26, 2020. I send to Jeff uh, about the failed predictions themselves. So here at this time, I'm just studying the Mayan calendar and putting it into place, right? That it is connected to, and I already knew it was connected way back in November of 2018, but I'm developing this. So it's not going to be April 26 that I actually see that it's failed predictions are in this line. That is the September 23rd date. So, um, and, and that's going to be not until later that I'm going to understand that this date that we're using here. So that means I didn't understand the evangelical prophecy for the Revelation 12 sign prophecy in uh, September 23rd, 2017. I'm just fulfilling it by presenting a message on September 23rd. And, and then when I present the 273 um, on November 9th, I don't yet understand the line of failed predictions. So that's gonna be in uh, April of 2020. So it's gonna be still you know, five months away or whatever, six months away, that I'm going to come to understand that. But we still don't understand what our message to the Levites is. And, and we don't fully understand this March 27th, 2019 symbol. Now, here in this line, it's a formalization of a message. And that is... If we are to understand this message that was given on October 13th that points to 9-11, uh, 
um, we know that that this is pointing to 9-11, right? So October 13th is pointing to 9-11 as a symbol. We believe that it was like the movement, that it was a close of probation of some type. And it, and it was. Parminder and Tess presented that it was about Russia and the United States, King of the North and the King of the South. And that was wrong. And Jeff understood it was wrong prior to November 9th. So he's going to say that their predictions are going to fail. All their predictions are going to fail regarding November 9th. And every single one failed. <clears throat> Except maybe perhaps the idea of a closed door. But even then, how they saw that was they were going to then be perfect. <clears throat> but remember, you can't have a third without a first and a second. And if we're going to understand this correctly, are we under the proclamation of this third message that arrived on November 9th, 2019? You understand what I'm asking? Does anybody know what I'm asking? Because a message arrived, which we call the third angel's message, and we haven't really dealt so much with this arrival of the message and what it means. But in every line, we have an arrival of a message, and then we have a formalization of a message, and then we have... Um, an empowerment of a message, right? And then another message arrives, right? Every time after we've had an empowerment, it's going to lead to the arrival of some message. So this message that arrived has to be the message of the 273. And are we still under the proclamation of that message that arrived on November 9th, 2019. And if we, if, if we are, so just as we are under the proclamation of the message that arrived on October 22nd, 1844, um, we have this, this proclamation of the message, but things happen before that message is joined by the second angel, right? That's the angel of Revelation 18. So can we make the same type of application for this line particularly, even though this is, remember, a zoom into a way mark on a bigger line. But when it comes to this line of Deborah and Barak, right? So... Yeah, so my presentation that, that day was 273. That's what I presented on November 9th. So that's the message that arrived. And remember that this is still um, a uh, the formalization of the first angel's message under this judge's line, right? And it's going to lead to November 9th. But November 9th is also going to be the arrival of a third message, right? So this message of Je Deborah and Barak spans from September 23rd, 2017 to November 9th to this message, which is the line of Gideon. And so when we have these, these lines and we have these uh, way marks, and we zoom into a way mark. The question that I'm asking is a message that arrives, does it have, does it continue until all of these messages, all of these lines are completed? 
That is, we have an arrival of a message. And is it just going to end here with the line of Gideon? Or does it still continue? Because the message arrives here. Does that message then continue? And, and what I'm trying to say is, does this message of the 273, does it actually continue and have a point in which it is then empowered? And that that, that would be a way mark on some other line above it. Not even just this line, but even the line above this line. Does that make sense to anyone? Yeah, so on November 9th, I did two presentations entitled 273, right? And we know that it's, that's a doubling and that we have the doubling of that 273 in, in that line from October 11th, 2019 to April 9th, 2021. And remember that this November 9th is also followed by 63 days that is followed by 63 weeks that lead to March 27th, 2021. So if we're going to deal with JL and the spike, what does JL, the wife of Heber, who's a Kenite, and this spike represent more specifically? I mean, it relates to a message to the Levites. Is anybody following what I'm doing? <clears throat> so when we look at this, these verses here, um, you know, J.L. Heber's wife took a nail of the tent and I'm using that tent, the 168, that's the Hebrew number, which relates to, um, to a calculation having to do with my tent, my home growing up, and took an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail in his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was asleep and weary, so he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Right, so this is, so the message of Barak is the message of July 18th that is um, conquering um, the message of Parminder. And is that happening um, on November 9th as well? Is July 18th part of that uh, discussion when we get to November 9th? Are we looking forward to July 18th? Right, so we can see that that relates to the messages that Jeff is giving, uh, that Stephen and Odilio are presenting, um, exposing Parminder. Uh, that, that's all been happening in that history. Now, JL came out to meet him, that is Barak. So this other message, the message of the 273, comes out to meet the message of July 18th. Can we say that that characterizes is what happened on November 9th. I would believe so. Okay. And said unto him, come, I will show thee the man whom thou seekest, right? And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. And, and this is what how I picture what happened on November 9th. And so God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel. So the particular darkness that they've been under has been 
subdued with this death of Sisera. That is, that message is the message that puts an end to, for whoever's going to hear it, um, that influence of spiritual formation of Catholic spiritualism, which is really just another form of pagan spiritualism, of paganism, um, for this message. That is, the reception of that message that happened on November 9th is essential for this movement to understand if we're going to put an end to uh, Jabin, king of Canaan, and also Sisera, the influence. Right, and then it says, the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So even though they subdued him, there still is this process, which we're under presently, uh, of destroying Jabin, king of Canaan. Can we agree with that? In the situation that we're looking at it, I would I would say yes. Now let's let's also recall that there was Jabin king of Hazor during the time of Joshua. Yeah. And dealing with Jabin with Sisera this time, we're dealing with a second Jabin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that would mean that this situation with Parminder and Tess is a second occurrence of issues that had been raised up say, during the time of the Millerites, and has to again be dealt with within our time. Okay, yeah. And, um, you know, if we were going to take, uh, so I'm just going to look back here what we have. So we, we're, we're dealing with, we've been dealing with the judges for a long time. Um, the line of Gideon. Got to go back to these other lines that we had. Um here, I'm just going to share the screen, even though I haven't found it yet. Okay. So when we were going back and studying, um, this is a long time ago, a lot of stuff has happened. Um, Okay, so here, here we're going to deal with this this history. Now, um, so we got Egypt to the Promised Land. Um, so that's going to be in the story of Joshua. And where would Jabin be in this line? So Jabin's in chapter eleven of. Of, of Joshua, Joshua 11, 1. <clears throat> it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard those things that he sent Jobab, king of Madam, to the king of Shimron and the king of Aksaph, and to the kings that were in the north mountains and the plains south of uh, uh, Gennesaret, in the valley and in the borders of Dor on the west, and the Canaanite on the east and the west, to the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, in the mountains, in the Hivite, under Hermon, in the land of Mizpeh. And they went out, and all their hosts with them, much with much people, even as the sand upon the seashore, in multitude, with horses and chariots, very, very many. And when these kings were met together, they came and pitched together in the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time, I will deliver them all up slain before Israel. Though uh, thou shalt 
hoe ho their horses or how their horses or, or ha. Can't remember how we pronounce that word. It's basically hawk. hawk, hawk their horses. That's right. And burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Miram suddenly, and they fell upon them. So the waters of Miram, um, this is going to be, where would we put this in our lines? Um, in any of these lines. I'm trying to think if we had this as a waymark even. Um, I don't think we did it as a waymark. I don't think we did, right? So, I mean, that's probably something we need to look at because it has some symbols there that are quite important. Well, especially uh, especially because this would be first mention. And then we have the Jabin that we're dealing with in, in Judges to be kind of a, a completion of that first mention. Yeah, now I don't know how many kings they gather here. Um, there, this is, you know, this is a, a huge uh, battle, but the symbol here is Joshua 11.1. So 11.1 is what? Well, would you be looking at this as the 11th day of the first month? Yeah. So it's the 11th day of the first month. Now, we have that in two different ways in our lines. We have it January 11th, 2020, that Jeff marks as the end of that 126 days beginning on September 7th, 2019. But we also have it um, in our line in 2023, right? So January 11th was the end of Colin's um, prediction if he had actually put it into chronology, right? if he had followed logically through with his thinking. Um, and so we have Jabin here as well. Now we can say that that the story of Judges is a repeat of this history, because you're trying to say that this is like Millerite history in some way, repeating in our history, and that this Jabin then occurring is, well, it's one of the enemies left in the land, so to speak, that then has to be dealt with in our history, right? Is that basically what you're saying? Dwight, can't hear you. Might not be, might not be there. So we got this January 11th date, and, and it's repeated in our history. Now, what about what is there any other date it can represent? Okay. Uh, the first day of the 11th month. Okay. So it can represent November 1st. Is that date significant at all? In any way that we're, that we can address to what we're studying here. Okay, when did the Ottoman Empire fall? I think it was on that date in, in, in 1922. Right. Am I correct? So November 1st, 1922. Good memory. So that, and that not, date. Not at all. <laughs> and that date on the biblical calendar 
is uh, the eleventh day of the eighth month, right? That is, it's the eleventh of Heshvan, Heshvan, right? So now remember, we had eighteen forty, the eleventh day of the eighth month, August eleventh, for the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And that is the correct biblical date for that prophecy to be fulfilled. But actually, the, Alta, the Sultanate, the Ottoman Sultanate, does not cease until November 1st, 1922. But it is also on the 11th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar. So I think that's an important symbol uh, there as well. So does... Does the 11th day of the first month and the first day of the 11th month have then a connection to, to Islam and to our lines in the context of tying together Islam, the, the first day of the 11th month here in 1922, with our lines addressing uh, January 11th? Or is this just... Uh, an insignificant uh, coincidence that doesn't mean anything? Or can we take this story here of having something to do with this message about July 18th in this, this story of Javan and also the other story of Javan? So it's something to think about. Okay. As a question okay. yeah. is there is there any relevance to the 11th day of the first month on on the line during the week of passover no the 10th day of the first month you select the, select the, lamb. the lamb right and you're going to keep that until the beginning of the uh, the 14th. But wasn't the 11th day of the first month the day where Christ cleansed the temple a second time? Okay, so he's he's going to go into the temple uh, on the 9th at sunset, so beginning the 10th, right? So after they have the uh, Palm Sunday thing, right? Then, then he goes into the temple. The sun sets, Ellen White says, he goes into the temple. And that, that to me would be where the lamb is being um, chosen, right? Now, because he, what's that? Wasn't, wasn't he with Peter and other of the disciples on the 10th in the temple? Yeah, so the next day, yeah, so they're, they're, he's there in the evening, and then they come the next day. They're staying at Bethany, right? So right. it's not far of a walk and so then it comes the next day on which is still the 10th and uh, so i'm trying to remember all the details we did a study on this uh back in when i was there at the school of the prophets in 2018 um so i don't have the answer to your question exactly of how those um uh, uh, how exactly the chronology of that Passion Week went, because there was lots of difference of opinions on how it unfolded. Um, if I go to, I know I have a document on it. See if I can quickly find it. I think on the eleventh uh, day of the first month is when the, the fig tree is found to be cursed. Okay. And then and then Jesus goes into the temple and he uh, exposes the Pharisees as hypocrites and to instructs the people not to trust him. And that's where he uh, pronounces curses upon them. Yeah, so, yeah, I think you're right there. But but something happens on the 10th, too. Um, so let me see here. I think that's when he cleanses the temple. 
Well, I think he does it actually sort of uh, some, what happens on the 10th though. I don't, I, I believe he's there in the temple with disciples. They're observing all that's going on. I, I agree with Stephen. I believe they returned to Bethany. He was unable to find any fruit on the fig tree and curses it. Because the situation on the cleansing of the temple took place during the daylight hours, not during the evening hours. Yeah, so when the, on the Sunday, he would have the uh, triumphal entry. Right. And then on the Monday, he then cleanses the temple. He, he goes to the curse tree, the, the fig tree, and curses it. Yeah, he, that's on the 10th. Yes. yes, and then on the 11th, which is a Tuesday, he, um, he pa they pass the fig tree and Peter finds that it's delivered. And then yeah. he goes out the temple and pronounces curses into the Pharisees. Yeah, I think that's correct. And then Aran has, has posted in the in the chat Deuteronomy one verse three. came to pass in the 40th year on the 11th month, on the first day of the month that Moses spake to the children of Israel. Yeah, so that's going to be the, the pronouncement of, of the book of Deuteronomy is going to be given on that date. Right. Yeah. But that's that's a repeat largely of many of the instructions that were given in Leviticus, right? Uh, well, Deuteronomy 28 is specifically going to be... Um, Leviticus 26. But yes, I mean, Deuteronomy is just a repetition of their entire history. Right. right. So it, it's going to, it's, it's, it means a second time, right? They're just, just repeating that. But yeah, so I have these um, two papers. So Stephen is correct. I'd worked out the chronology of, of the Passion Week. And so I have it in one of the papers. So I have all the dates there. It's called The Chronology of Christ's Final Week, a paper that I did. I haven't published it. So the, yeah, it's going to be on the, the Tuesday that he uh, utters the curses against the, the priests or against the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and all that. So, yeah, so it's on the 10th that he cleanses the temple. So, but can we take this uh, Deuteronomy um, one and and tie it to tie this together, the eleven one and the one eleven or whatever, however you want to look at it? Um, because we know in Deuteronomy, the main thing that we have there is the is the blessings and the curses. Now, the thing interesting about Deuteronomy is they he gives the instructions for what's going to happen later after they cross uh, the Jordan, right? Okay, so so we got a lot of threads here that we're trying to tie together. These are more strands than threads, but okay. So now we're going to look, we're, we're going to try to understand what this means, because when I look at, uh, yeah, we really need to draw that that out. We need to draw out some of these lines from Joshua as well. Hmm. 
So if Jabin is subdued on November 9th, 2019, um, through Cicero receiving this spike from JL. So specifically, what is the spike? I mean, how can we relate this as a symbol? Is there something about a spike that becomes becomes the symbol? Now it's a nail, of course. Now, when we when we deal address with the nail, I mean there are different uh, different words that are translated nail. But this one here, um, yatad, um, a nail, a paddle, a pin, a stake, it occurs um, uh, first time is in Exodus, dealing with the pins. Um, so all the vessels of the tabernacle and all the service thereof and all the pins thereof and all the pins, the cord shall be a brass. So it's talking about these uh, pins that are being used. It's in Numbers 3, which is interesting. Because after we have this issue with the, um, the Levites, it's going to mention... Um, those that have responsibilities, and one is they, they're responsible for the pins. And we know this is the pin of a tent that is in the story of, of, of JL, but it's called the nail, the nail of the tent. And it's mentioned in Ezra 9, 8. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place, which, of course, connects us to Isaiah 22. And I'll fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be a glorious throne to his father's house. And, of course, that ties us to uh, the message of the open and the shut door in Revelation relating to um the Church of Philadelphia. So what is this nail then? Is it also connect to the anchor in Hebrews? Yes, to the anchor in Hebrews. Yep. The anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, that entereth into that with it, which is within the veil. And yeah, it's mentioned, yeah, Judges 421. And we got, uh, so if you take this verse, so he died, it's book verse um, 111. So it's the 111th verse in the book of Judges and the reverse book verse of 508. So the differential is 777. Now, is there then 776 verses in the book of Judges? The 777, it has to do with the Gematria. Oh, this is the gematria. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that this verse, so what's the reverse book verse, reverse book? It's just measured from book? the end of the book. Okay. Okay. So from the end of the book, it's 111. Actually, the other way. Okay. So it's, so it's yeah. 111. And Okay. So that yeah okay so they don't add up to uh, seven 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 I didn't even see that so that'd be like 
669 or 619. Okay. And then the differential of the gematria of that verse is 777. Okay. And so the 508, that gives us the year for the start of the 1290 and the 1335. Uh, and then the 111, that's tying us to that symbol that we're talking about here. And, and then we have this differential of the gematria, which is 777. So that's subtracting two numbers, uh, the reverse gematria and the forward gematria, right? Yep. Where, where A is one or where Z is one. Okay, and then you subtract them and you get 777, okay? So what does this all meaning as far as this line is concerned then? So this spike, this nail in a sure place, what, what specific part of the message would it represent? Wouldn't this represent righteousness by faith? I think that's a good application. Okay. Now, so one of the things that we see that Parminder was teaching was a, um, I wouldn't even call it a counterfeit righteousness by faith. Um, it was just, it was just righteousness by works. And, and he did it by, one, by lowering the standard of righteousness to something that was obtainable to humans that we should all be able to do apart from God, which righteousness to him was just being nice. If we can be nice, and anybody can be nice, that's all that was really required. Right? And, and so such a standard of righteousness that his followers could claim that they are righteous and see themselves as righteous. Um, and, and yet being unwilling to be reproved for wrong. So that's not righteousness. So this, this date of November 9th, of course, is this dividing line where we have this belief that they're going to believe that they are perfect, which is really antithetical to the whole idea of righteousness by faith. So there is a message to the Levites. And as much as you know, I enjoy all this chronology and dates and stuff, these are not the message. God is giving us this as a witness to this movement so that we can work together in harmony to develop our characters and to prepare ourselves to give a message to the Levites, prepare the message itself. <clears throat> and, and to me, that's the most important part of this. This movement is the message to the Levites. That's our role and our purpose. So we are still under the proclamation of that message. Right? That message arrived, and that work has to be done. <clears throat> now, just a quick look at the song of Deborah and Barak. So in this... The story, it's going to repeat um, this story, of course, but um, obviously in a more poetic way. But it's also going to um, tie a bunch of other symbols from other places. And then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Obinuim, on that day, saying, Praise you the Lord for avenging, for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. 
Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the God of Israel. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped, and the clouds also dropped water. And the mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the God of Israel. So one of the things we see here in this is its imagery dealing with the giving of the Ten Commandments, right, with the outpouring of, of rain. Um, in the day, and then it's going to refer in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased, they ceased in Israel, until that I, Deborah, arose, and I rose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods, then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people, bless ye the Lord. Speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water. So the arches re archers refer to what? Islam. Islam, right? In the places of drawing water. So so delivered from the noise of the archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts towards the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Are we rehearsing the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel? Aren't we rehearsing them? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, we are. Okay. Awake, awake. So that's the midnight cry message. <laughs> Deborah, awake, awake. Utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. Um, then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people, and the Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek, after thee Benjamin among thy people. Out of Maker came down governors, and out of Zebulun they have handled the pen of the writer. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot in the into the valley for the divisions of Reuben. There were great thoughts of heart. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there was great searchings of heart. Gibeon, Gibe, a Gilead also beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Zebulun and Naphtali were people that jeopardied, jeopardied their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. The kings came and fought. They fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera, which is referring to time, right? Time prophecies. Um, so this is the chronology fighting against Parminder's message. I think that's possible. The river of Kaishan swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kaishan. O oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horse hooves broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. Kershi Maraz said the angel of the Lord, Kershi bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Blessed above women shall Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above the women in the tent. She asked water, he asked water, and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. At her feet, he bowed. He fell. He lay down. At her feet, he bowed. He fell. 
Where he bowed, there he fell down. The mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariot? Her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two? To Sisera, a prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest 40 years. So, I mean, we, we looked at this before, and we looked at some of the symbolism in this this story um, and in this this song, uh, and we can see that this is typifying. Now we have all these different tribes that are mentioned. Uh, by the way, so we got. Uh, I wanted to look at that. Um, so we have Ephraim, Benjamin, Zebulun mentioned, Issachar, Reuben. Um, then it mentions Zebulun again, and Naphtali, and Dan. Um, and so it mentions of uh, seven of the 12 tribes that I could see. Ephraim, Benjamin, Zebulun, Issachar, Reuben, Dan, and Naphtali. So, so why are they mentioned? Why is there seven of the 12 mentioned? I mean, do we have all of them mentioned in the preceding chapter? Because we're going to have four mentioned, right? Um, who do we have? So we have Ephraim, uh, Zebulun, and Naphtali. And so that's three... So I guess we have three mentioned in chapter four and eight mentioned in chapter five. Any thoughts on that? Why they're mentioned? I hadn't thought about it that way yet. Okay. Because yeah, we don't have Simeon mentioned, Levi. We don't have um, Manasseh mentioned. Um, we don't have those. Um, was Asher mentioned? In Judges five seventeen. Yeah. Okay. So Asher. That's so. There's actually eight mentioned, right? Because I thought I had seen Asher. Okay, so you got eight of them mentioned here. Um, so we don't have Simeon or Levi mentioned or Manasseh. Of course, Levi's usually not numbered among them. And Gad is not mentioned. So, and then of course, Judah isn't mentioned. Okay. So it's something to consider here about, about why this story is told in this way. Um, now what about Judges 5.25? So he asks for water. So 
would that be symbolically the living water? And she gives him milk. So what symbol would we take from milk? Well, milk can actually refer to affliction, like butter and honey sh shall he eat. Um, they eat that are remain in the land, right? Um, so I don't know. And then you've got you've got the symbol of the butter in a lordly dish. But how is that you know translated from the Hebrew? Well, it just means um, a wide, glorious, large, goodly, noble, princely. And then a dish uh, just means like a basin, a basin, a bowl, a dish. Uh, butter being a uh, kima, uh, curdled milk, cheese or butter, uh, milk itself, kalab, uh, cheese or milk. So just a different word they're related um, hmm. I don't know it's just the number 525 so if we look at 525 we know that that relates to uh, the span of time from July 18th to December 25th, 2021. So there's some, some things here that, you know, we probably could look at. I don't know if that's going to change. I mean, it's not going to, nothing here that's going to change what we've said. But what about the mother of Sisera looking out the window and crying through the lattice? So who's the mother of Sisera? as a symbol. Especially a mother that's weep mourning here. Because Parminda represents a message that really is uh, a papal message. Right. Okay. Now, what about the lattice that she cries through? Well, so, like I said before, Rome has spies and workers worldwide and has spread its influence worldwide and is the mother of harlots. Yeah. And Judges 528, the gematria for that verse, the differential is 327. This verse. So we have this tearing, and we also have the wheels of his chariots. And we have this lattice. Now, lattice can re represent line upon line. But could this represent Parminder's message as this false message? The lattice and the wheels of his chariots? I think that's possible. And the tarrying, of course, his his message has not come to pass. He's it's the failure of his message. Now I, I don't know, you know, exactly what's happening with Parminder's movement. They don't seem to be very visible. Um, I know that people that have followed Parminder are still seem to be 
um, in the same line of thinking, the ones that I'm friends with on Facebook. They don't interact with anybody, but you know, anybody in our message here. But um, Parminder definitely did not accomplish what he set out to accomplish. I mean, he may have gained a lot of followers in his movement, but I don't know how many of those have really survived. The movement is not active like it was. I mean, I still watch some of their presentations every once in a while, just a little bit. You'll see the odd presentation that I can find on YouTube that somebody posts. But they really have no direction. I mean, they're caught up in the wokeism. And um, things aren't unfolding the way that they expected. And in some ways, you know, um, they expected Trump to come in and, um, you know, regain power and stuff as well, from what I understand. Yeah, if probation closed, no need to do anything. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure, you know, how to understand this, but I would think that the mother of Cicero has to refer to this message that Parminder's message was based upon. And it's, it's mourning, right? Um, in, in a sense. So that message has come to an end, and so is our time here. So let's close with prayer. A dear Father in heaven, we just ask that you can be with us through the rest of this day and bring us together again as we look at um, the story of Gideon tomorrow. If there's any loose ends that we need to tie up, we ask that you can help us do that and in our personal study and that we can bring those things tomorrow. Be with us throughout the rest of this day, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.